Hey everyone, today I'm going to be summarizing and analyzing the book Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you have any questions, please ask them after the video. Before I begin, just note that by summarizing a non-fiction book such as this one, I'm leaving out a ton of information. Neil managed to somehow fit a large part of the vast field of astrophysics into just 208 pages. So if you're interested, I highly suggest reading this book. Anyway, there are 12 chapters in this book, and I'm going to be explaining the main topic in each chapter. After that, I'll explain why this information is important, and how it has helped us. Oh, and a fair warning, none of this might actually make any sense, and uh, I don't really blame you, so just sit tight and try your best to understand. Chapter 1, The Big Bang. The universe started off as a very, very, very small point. However, this point contained all of the matter and energy of the universe we know today. So, some mysterious force managed to cause this point to do what we call the Big Bang. In the first trillionth of a second of the universe, it was so hot that the basic forces of nature were unified, but were eventually split into four. Right now, the universe is just a soup of a bunch of particles. In the first millionth of a second, this soup was a continuous cycle of creation, annihilation, and recreation of these particles. In the first seconds of the universe, it was cool enough for hadrons to be created, which then resulted into protons and neutrons. Two minutes have passed by and the universe grew to a few light years and cooled down a little bit, allowing protons and neutrons to become atomic nuclei and create the first atoms. For the time after the Big Bang, the universe continued to expand and eventually cooled down enough for electrons to bind with nuclei. This matter eventually formed galaxies and other fun stuff. Chapter 2, Universal Physical Laws. It's important to acknowledge that all of the laws of physics apply everywhere, whether it be on Earth, our distant galaxies, the planet of an alien civilization, or your house kitchen. These laws are accompanied with the existence of physical constants. For example, the gravitational constant, also known as Big G, supports Newton's equation of gravity, can help find a star's luminosity, and is used in Einstein's general relativity. When making any scientific claims, it's best to note these physical laws. People in the past used to say, we'll never be able to fly, or we'll never be able to split the atom, or even we'll never go to the moon. These were believable quotes until they were proven wrong, but what they had in common was that none of those quotes had the laws of physics that stood before them. This is why saying something like, we'll never be able to outrun a beam of light, is different. It follows the laws of physics and physical principles. As Neil said, after the laws of physics, everything else is opinion. Chapter 3, The Cosmic Microwave Background The cosmic background is an incarnation of the leftover light from the early universe. When the universe cooled down after the Big Bang, the photons that were previously visible light lost energy and became infrared photons. Today, the photons from the Big Bang lost some more energy and shifted from infrared to microwave photons, thus the name Cosmic Microwave Background, best known as CMB. So why is this thing important? Well, the CMB allows you to sort of decode the universe, specifically all the fundamental cosmic properties. You can figure out how galaxies and clusters and superclusters came to be. You could compare the temperatures of any part of the universe. You could also infer how strong gravity was at that time. You could also deduce how much ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy there is in the universe. With this information, you could ultimately tell whether or not our universe will expand forever. Chapter 4, Intergalactic Space. Even though the empty void between galaxies may seem like a whole bunch of nothingness, there's a whole lot more happening than you think. Because of our modern detectors and advanced telescopes, we can reveal the invisible. With the detectors, we could find dwarf galaxies, runaway stars, runaway stars that explode, X-ray emitting gas, dark matter, faint blue galaxies, gas clouds, high energy charged particles, and even dark energy. With our advanced telescopes, we could see light that our own eyes cannot see. Here's what the sky will look like in different types of lights. Chapter 5, Dark Matter. Gravity is best known as the warping in the fabric of space-time produced by any combination of matter and energy. When scientists measure the bulk of all gravitational forces in the universe, they notice that 85% of it didn't interact with the known matter and energy. After a Swiss astronomer named Fritz Zwicky examined the Coma Galaxy Cluster, he noticed that it didn't really follow the laws of gravity. It just so happened that the amount of matter needed to result in the orbital velocity of the galaxies did not match the amount of matter that was seen. This meant some mysterious invisible matter was binding the matter and the galaxies together. Now, we call this thing dark matter, however, we really don't know what it is, which is definitely keeping scientists busy. 
Chapter 6, Dark Energy We also don't know what dark energy is. In recent decades, the universe was discovered to have a mysterious pressure that acts opposite to gravity. When Einstein made his equations for general relativity, he included what was called the cosmological constant, labeled as lambda, and was supposed to represent a static universe. Lambda's job was to oppose gravity from pulling the universe to one mass. Eventually, Einstein thought about it and removed the constant, calling it his life's greatest blunder. However, later on, scientists noticed that the galaxies were becoming dimmer, meaning that they were moving away, meaning that the universe was expanding. After putting lambda back into Einstein's equations, they noticed that the new equations fit the real state of the universe. Dark energy is now presumed to be the negative force that allows the universe to not only expand, but accelerate. Chapter 7, The Periodic Table In the book, Neil described not the periodic table itself, but rather the roles individual elements have in the universe. I won't be describing every element, but just note that each element has their significance to the universe. For example, hydrogen takes up 90% of the atoms in the cosmos, oxygen and carbon are major ingredients of earth life, titanium is pretty strong, and iron is responsible for many things in the universe, especially with stars. Also, there's a lot of elements that are named after fictional and real people, such as thorium or einsteinium. Chapter 8, The Sphere It turns out that physical laws really like the sphere out of all shapes. This is because spheres in nature are made by forces that want to make objects smaller in all directions. For small objects, this force is surface tension. For example, soap bubbles are made possible because surface tension squeezes the air in all directions, thus enclosing the air in the smallest possible surface area. For larger objects, this force is gravity. Gravity is the force that serves to collapse matter in all directions. This is why every planet in our solar system, plus our sun, is shaped like a sphere. Just know when I say sphere, I don't mean perfect spheres. Many large objects that look like spheres are actually irregular. For example, even the Earth isn't a perfect sphere because its rotational speed causes the equator to bulge. Chapter 9, Light Even though it might not seem like it, there's a lot more light than the light we see. We see what is called visible light, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. People used to believe that this was the only light that existed until this guy named William Herschel laid down a glass prism to see the rainbow and placed a thermometer outside of the colors. He already knew that there would be a different temperature for every color, and he expected the uncolored parts to be around room temperature. However, he found that it was hotter than the temperature of red when he placed the thermometer to the right of red. He then concluded that there was light given from the sun that is unfit for vision. We now know these different types of light and call their scale the electromagnetic spectrum. Eventually, we found ways to see the sky in different types of light using advanced telescopes. Chapter 10, Comets, Asteroids, and Moons. Even though our solar system might look empty, there's a lot of chunky stuff that exists between the planets. For example, Earth barrels through hundreds of tons of meteors per day. Don't worry though, because our atmosphere protects us from most of these. Most asteroids in our solar system live in an asteroid belt, some of which in the next 100 million years will hit Earth and kill almost all life. There's also the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, which are full of comets. The moons of the planets are described to be more interesting than the planets for some reason, and Neil supports this by showing how diverse Jupiter's moons are. Chapter 11, Aliens In this chapter, Neil describes how it would be if aliens tried to take a look at Earth. They would first notice how our planet has water and determine some of our planet's properties, such as atmosphere and temperature. It would be hard to even detect our planet in the first place though, since our planet is relatively small and is blinded by the sun. The best ways for aliens to find us is to measure the sun's brightness changes, use chemical fingerprints, or you measure the wiggle of the sun. However, these aliens represent us as we try to find other extraterrestrial life in different exoplanets in our galaxy. Also, fun fact, looking at the sky is basically a time machine. The farther you look into the sky, the farther back in time you see. This is because the light exerted from what we are seeing takes longer to reach our eyes than seeing something closer. So if aliens tried to look at us from, let's say, 4.25 light years away, they would see Earth 4.25 years ago. Chapter 12, A Cosmic Perspective I might have to skip this one because it's basically a chapter where Neil has an existential crisis, but it talks about the significance of a cosmic perspective and how it's better to embrace it instead of fear it. Even though I won't explain it, I highly recommend reading this chapter alone. Alright, so why do we need to know all this? In other words, why do we need astrophysics? Astrophysics, in the most part, is what allows us to explore the cosmos physically and not only from our sight. Without it, we would not have this, or this, or any of this. Astrophysics also allows for technology to progress and advance. Because of this science, we have telescopes, supercomputers, and some other cool stuff. If you want to know what technologies we can accomplish in the future, click on that link in the description or that card on the top right. All of what was said in this book is interconnected with the one setting, the universe. 
Neil described the fascinations of the universe from the birth of it to the present while hinting what was to come in the far future. It's important to acknowledge that while we live in the universe, the universe also lives within us, and I don't mean that figuratively. Neil pointed out that the four most chemically active elements in the universe, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, are the four most common elements of life on Earth. Most people fear the cosmic perspective, especially since it makes us feel insignificant and small. Some other people embrace the cosmic perspective, knowing that our knowledge of it is what makes us special. Personally, I used to fear this perspective a lot because it's scary and dark and lonely, and I'm starting to embrace it more though, because otherwise this video wouldn't be possible. And there you have it, astrophysics for people in a hurry, in a hurry. If you see anyone sleeping, please tap them lightly on the shoulder to wake them up and tell them I said sorry. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you liked this video, please leave a like. And if you didn't, please leave a like. Anyways, goodbye.